Welcome to What the Paper Said, in which I, Patrick Crozier, skim through the times from 100 years ago, read some of the articles, and comment on the ones I find interesting. In this episode, the week ending the 28th of October 1923, protectionism rears its ugly head. But first, stuff that's caught my attention this week. A Rhineland Republic has been proclaimed in Aix la Chapelle, or Aachen as it's known nowadays. There's very little resistance to this. The Times has an explanation. This is from Monday the 22nd of October. Deprived of their leaders by the long-continued process of imprisonment and expulsion, a process which is still continuing, the Rhinelanders are like sheep without a shepherd. Unemployment, hunger and anxiety for the future have brought them to a frame of mind where any strong resistance to action approved of by the French and supported by their troops is most unlikely. There have also been riots in Hamburg, which have left 40 dead. The Times has continued to publish extracts from Winston Churchill's The World Crisis. This week he continued to claim that Gallipoli was a great idea and all that was required for success was a bit of persistence. This despite the fact that the army commander on the spot, the naval commander on the spot, the war minister and the first sea lord all disagreed. Panel doctors are in a dispute over pay. What is a panel doctor, I hear you ask? Let me explain. Shortly before the First World War, the government introduced the National Insurance Scheme. Workers were taxed, their employers were taxed, and in return they were entitled to medical services from doctors on the National Insurance Panel, hence the term panel doctors. You're now not so occasional reminder that the welfare state did not begin with the Labour government of 1945. Anyway, they are so unhappy with their pay that many of them are resigning. State-employed doctors in a dispute over pay. Couldn't happen today. I saw this in an article about railway rates on Tuesday the 23rd. Under the Railways Act, 1921, the charges to be fixed in the first instance for each amalgamated company shall be such as with the other sources revenue will, in the opinion of the Rates Tribunal, so far as practicable, yield with efficient and economical working and management an annual net revenue to be known as the standard revenue equivalent to the aggregate net revenues in 1913 of the constituent companies and the subsidiary companies absorbed. I shall attempt to translate. Freight rates and ticket prices will be set by the government so that the railway companies make the same profit as they did before the war. A profit cap, in other words. There is little doubt in my mind that railways would inevitably be largely replaced by vehicles powered by internal combustion engines travelling on roads, but this did not help. Fixed freight rates meant that railways had little incentive to deal with small customers, while their competitors knew exactly how much to charge in order to undercut them. Fixed-price passenger tickets meant there was a little incentive for railway companies to cater for those who wanted to travel in comfort and were prepared to pay a little more. Staying on the railways. In old movies set in Britain, if someone is travelling by train, they will be travelling in a compartment. One of the railway companies has introduced a carriage which doesn't have a compartment. Not everyone is happy, and certainly not an ALN Russell of Ebury Street, Westminster. This is from Saturday the 27th. Many people will view with anxiety the introduction by one of our railway groups of a new type of carriage, which seems to be on the lines of the ordinary dining car. This may have advantages, e.g. an increased luggage space, But it would be sad to learn that on a long journey, as when travelling by night to Scotland, one is to lose the chance of having a carriage to oneself, and with luck being able to lie at full length on a seat. But if you can't do that, you will need a good book, such as Whose Body by one Dorothy L. Sayers, as advertised in Friday's edition. This will be the first of the Lord Peter Whimsey stories. Protectionism, or putting tariffs or taxes on foreign goods and other measures, is an idea that has been floating around British politics for a couple of decades by this point. A solution in search of a problem. In 1906, the Conservative Party made it part of their programme and lost in a landslide. But this has not deterred them. This week, the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, made a speech to the Conservative Conference extolling its virtues. This is from Friday the 26th. Now, from what I have said... 
I think you will realise that to me, at least, this unemployment problem is the most crucial problem of our country. I regard it as such. I can fight it. I am willing to fight it. I cannot fight it without weapons. I have for myself come to the conclusion that, owing to the conditions that exist today in the world, having regard to the economic environment, having regard to the situation of our country, if we go pottering along as we are, we shall have grave unemployment with us to the end of time. And I have come to the conclusion myself that the only way of fighting this subject is by protecting the home market. Loud and continued cheering. This is what is known as a mistake, on two levels. Firstly, and spoiler alert, Baldwin will in a couple of months hold a general election where this is the main issue. He will lose that general election. Secondly, protectionism doesn't work. But I'll leave Madsen Peary to explain that in the video linked in the description. And I hope the end screen. Anyway, that's all for this week. I aim to have something up next week, but I promise nothing.